Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, I'm joined by my friend, uh, Dr. Michael Lipson, and we're going to be speaking about myopia management standard of care on the Myopia Podcast. Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Hey, friends, before we get started on the podcast, I just wanted to bring up that we're doing something called the Myopia Workshop. Our first one is December 6th and 7th at the Hilton Bellevue, which is right outside of Seattle. We're going to be bringing in uh, leading experts around myopia management, uh, Randy Kojima, Pat Caroline, uh, Christina Yee, uh, and, and others to talk about myopia management and implementing it into your practice. So many people are telling me, I want to get started on myopia management, or we're doing myopia management, but our conversions aren't very high. We want to be looking at how to get your conversions to 90%. How do you talk with parents and kiddos to get them started on myopia management as soon as possible? Check out the myopiaworkshop.com and plan to be with us December 6th and 7th. If you're listening to this after December 6th or 7th, 2024, make sure to stay tuned to the Myopia Workshop uh, at website, and we'll be directing you towards other workshops in the future. Thanks for joining us. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, Dr. Lipson, how are you, my man? It's good to see you. Doing great. How are you doing, Dave? Oh, it's so good. It's uh, it's awesome to get to talk to you about uh, some nerdy things. I always uh, enjoy <laughs> chatting with you because you've, you, as a clinician, you bring research perspectives that all of us want to know. You bring this perspective on things because you were a clinician for so long and have everything. So for those who aren't aware of what you're up to these days, uh, tell us about uh, your retirement and how you're just sitting on the beach all the time and doing nothing. Well, I'm happily retired from clinical practice. <laughs> right, I am right. uh, enjoying the beautiful Michigan summer right now. Um, I, I try to be outside as much as I can and uh, doing sports. I still play softball, pickleball, ride my bike and play my guitar a little bit. Good and uh, I do find a little time to do a little consulting to uh, keep my head in the game here of uh, eye care as well. So it's uh, it's kind of fun, but uh, nothing yep. I have to do. And it keeps me busy. The days go by fast and uh, I, I enjoy keeping up with our ever changing and constantly changing field of mm -hmm. myopia management, contact lenses, ortho -K, and all those other things that I'm interested in. Well, I've, I've always said if it wasn't for patients, we could get things done. And now <laughs> that you are uh, not seeing patients anymore, it seems like you are definitely getting things done from having this book that you put out a while ago, the articles that you're writing. I mean, these things yep. you did in clinical practice too, but yep. it seems like you're uh, you're not slowing down on the other side of things, the things that I benefit from. Maybe your oh, patients good. aren't benefiting, but yeah. So that's really awesome. Very cool. Oh, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Well, you wrote uh, a great little uh, uh, thing in the uh, optometry and vision science. I believe it was July of 2024 and uh, really started diving into this question is myopia management, the standard of care. Uh, for, so first of all, why did you put this together? And great, guess... great recap here. Um, it was published not as a research article, but as a letter to the editor. Right. I think they felt that there was some opinion came, coming in there. But I guess I tried to present it with a lot of citations and supporting literature from, you know, very recognized, internationally recognized sources. Um, but basically, I mean, it, it came from me, I guess, seeing all the uh, publications that are out there. It seems like in every publication that we see in eye care today, there's an article about myopia, myopia management. Mm -hmm. In every meeting that's promoted, there's something about myopia management. And then numerous webinars that are going on constantly. Seems like every week there's one on myopia management. Yeah. So I started looking at that and thinking, you know, back to my practice and talking to some colleagues who are still in practice and, you know, myopia management is a hot topic. And I guess I love it so much and I get passionate about it that I thought it's reached a level that every optometrist 
should be doing it, should be at least aware of it, if nothing else. And if they're um, really trained in it, you know, everybody should be doing it, but uh, everybody sh at least should be aware of it from older to younger to, uh, you know, basically any modality of practice, all of the doctors should be aware of myopia management. So I tried to give uh, some support to credibility for accepting this practice that became standard of practice for me, that it should be considered standard of care yeah. for yeah. our whole profession. Unfortunately, I think that there are a lot of people who see this as a subspecialty. And, uh, you know, when we all started uh, checking for glaucoma, that was not a subspecialty. That was just like, oh, now we need to be checking for people on this. We need to be exactly. looking at the back of the eye for, you know, the optic nerve. And, oh, now we're looking at the macula. Oh, we're looking at the peripheral retina. We're dilating. Those are things that may have for a brief period of time been been seen as a specialty, but then eventually it became standard of care. And that was something that everybody did. So take us back to another paper that you did where you were looking at orthokeratology and people that were doing that. And I, I'm going to tie these two together in some way. Can you remind me approximately how many uh, people are doing orthokeratology in the United States? Uh, referencing back to uh, a survey that mm -hmm. I published uh, with Louise Curcio uh, back in 2022. It was a survey of, you know, orthokeratology, trying to find the status of what's going on with OrthoK mm -hmm. throughout the United States. And at that point, we had a very good estimate that there were about 3,000 doctors who were practicing OrthoK. Yeah. Whether it was how active they were, we couldn't determine, but they were have ordered lenses at least within the last year uh -huh. and and some yeah. of those practices were ordering you know two patients a year and others were doing um probably 20 patients a day uh -huh. <laughs> so yeah so yeah. It, there was there was quite a variation in that but about three thousand active prescribers of ortho yeah. so so now with the other modalities being outside of myopia management which you know we in the united states at least we have you know, spec we don't have spectacles yet. We have orthokeratology, soft multifocals, atropine. Um, and but orthokeratology, having been the oldest one that's been around, if only three thousand people are doing it, we know it is not yet standard of care. So in your paper, uh, when you were your letter to the editor, you talked about some um some organizations who are pretty credible organizations. And I think we could probably put the American Optometric Association with their recent um, venture uh, along with Cooper Vision and, and others uh, along uh, myopia management uh, as being something where they're seeing it slide into standard of care, whether they're calling it that yet or not. But you, you, you talked about the International Myopia Institute, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, World Council of Optometry, the World Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. Mm -hmm. So these are not just optometry organizations. These are eye care organizations, ophthalmology exactly. industry as well. So that kind of speaks to, you know, these organizations are calling it standard of care. And I think that's a good start for us. Do you agree? I it's a great start that people are recognizing myopia, number one, is a more than just an inconvenience or a refractive yeah. error, that myopia is a serious vision condition and, you know, creates risk for patients in terms of their long-term eye health, as well as issues that affect both immediate and uh, more short-term uh, effects on their vision. Uh, but yes, uh, the AOA really stopped short of yeah. coming to a standard of care statement. They, they actually put out a guideline for treatment, you know, mm -hmm. for those who are actually treating. But, um, you know, uh, like especially the IMI, they've been a big leader in that. The International yeah. Myopia Institute have really taken the lead and this World Council of Optometry. Um, yeah. The World Council of Optometry actually came out with the strongest statement relative to standard of care. And theirs really involved 
a three prong approach to myopia. Mm -hmm. um, that being what they called mitigation, measurement, and management. Yeah. And uh, taking those strong approaches, basically, they made some very definite recommendations along those lines on how doctors can take a more active role in uh, delaying myopia onset in mm -hmm. terms of uh, the measurement and, and follow up that's necessary to uh, track these kids as they uh, grow and develop and as well as the management aspects of it. So yeah. they took, they took the strongest stand. Yeah. I like their, that mitigation because they're, they're, they're acknowledging right up front that we can prevent and delay the onset, right? Exactly. That's the first place that we have to go. So many people are focusing on end stage disease that we fail to realize that we can stop end stage disease if we stop it at the onset. Mm -hmm. And that's really, I think where some of us are, are, are frustrated uh, at our profession. Obviously, we need to take care of those people who are struggling. But then, you know, we're also bringing up refraction and axial length on the measurement component. And we're starting to realize that myopia is not a refractive error. It is an axial length disease that's growing and stretching of the eye, causing all of those problems. Such an incredible component. So next steps here is where do we need to go uh, to help our clinician friends see this as standard of care and what's keeping us from getting there. Let's I solve think, that problem, Dr. Lipson. Just yeah, figure I can't, it out for all of us. Yeah, really, it's a simple <laughs> solution, right? <laughs> um, it's really getting people to accept the fact that, um, number one, we have the power to actually impact myopia progression to um, maybe delay its onset, but then to slow down its progression. And for many years, in, in terms of our education, the standard prescribing practices just said, okay, you should get a full correction for myopia. Yeah. You should correct your distance vision so that your vision is optimized for distance. And um, I think realizing that we have control over this, we can impact the end result of where that patient will end up, what the ultimate axial length of a patient may be with our intervention versus not intervening in these ways that we have shown, been shown that are evidence-based ways to slow down progression. Yeah. yeah. I think this may be a good time to diverge slightly from your question, not terribly, but sure that a lot of terminology has been thrown around relative to using the word myopia control versus myopia management. Okay. And mm -hmm. to throw in the third one, myopia correction. And I think the confusion there has muddled some of the surveys that have been out there to try to estimate how many doctors are actually involved in myopia control, myopia management today. Hmm. Because some of the doctors answering this says, well, I prescribe um, correction for my myopic patients. So I'm doing myopia management. I'm managing their myopia yeah. in the way that I feel is best. But to try to define it, I guess I did this in this letter, which is in, like I said, July's issue of OVS. Um, myopia correction is the standard prescribing of single vision contact lenses or glasses for the full distance correction, period. Mm -hmm. That's what we defined as myopia correction. When we talk about myopia control, we're talking about treatment modalities and interventions with proven efficacy to slow myopic progression and axial elongation. Yep. And as you mentioned before, that includes orthokeratology, multifocal soft lenses, special design spectacles, not in the U.S. just yet, um, and atropine. So those yeah. are myopia control modalities. When we talk about defining myopia management for purposes of this letter, and I think for our discussion for the rest of the evening here, we can talk about various strategies, myopia management is employing various strategies to slow myopic progression and axial elongation plus behavioral lifestyle 
and environmental modifications to delay and or slow that progression and axial elongation. So it, it takes myopia control and adds some of the um, additional factors that we can prescribe, especially the lifestyle changes. Yeah. Boy, that's good. That is uh, so brilliant. You know, I have been on forums and, you know, things on online and people are like, no, I do myopia management and <laughs> uh, they prescribe for their patients. But I really like this separation uh, that you've, how you've laid it out there mm -hmm. of myopia control. Um, if that's all you can do in your practice, great. That's a good start. But when you're managing myopia, you are following, adjusting, uh, changing, behaviorally modifying every aspect to really exactly. manage the level of myopia that a patient develops. And I love that. I think about a great case example of that is um, uh, the brother uh, had myopia management and had been in myopia management for two years in my practice. Mm -hmm. And the little sister was having exams and uh, she was um, hyperopic, uh, but she had gone from a plus one to a plus 50 at the age of five. And uh, so I intervened with atropine at plus 50, and then she was Plano and she was progressing very quickly in her axial length, somewhat in her refractive error, but we then added additional modifications because we were managing her myopia it was so confusing to her parents that we were utilizing optical corrections and pharmaceutical corrections to manage her myopia, mm -hmm. not being her refractive air, right? Being her axial length along. Exactly. And I just think that the way you define that and really put it out there is so key. So, you know, I would I like think... to, yeah, I would like ahead. to run with a little bit of a point that you just made in that case example. That's sure. a really critical one that I think a lot of people are not recognizing is the fact that we have to talk about myopia in terms of myopia management with all of our patients, not just the ones who are currently myopic. Yep. We have to start with them at four, five, six years old pre-myopia and we yeah. have to talk about the fact that risk factors are involved it looks like these are trends that are happening these are things that we see and like you said even if we are not actively prescribing myopia control interventions at that moment the topic of myopia management comes up before they're myopic so not only does it work to plant the seed for that existing patient, but there may be a, a sibling who's 10 years old, you're working with the six-year-old <laughs> and they say, well, my 10-year-old is already wearing glasses. They're not here right now, but, mm. or they have a brother or a cousin or somebody else they know in the family who could benefit from this. And you're spreading the word about that something can be done, actively yeah. done to control myopia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think the 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 negative in front of a, a, a refractive number being myopia <laughs> is also yes. the the problem, right? Yes. Um, so we've changed the definition of myopia in our practice to be a disease that causes elongation of the eyeball resulting in increasing refractive error, increased chances <laughs> of disease and it's a great way a of putting blur, it. increased blurry vision, right? So the disease is when the eyeball is getting longer at an abnormal rate, right? We do exactly. see normal growth, but abnormally. So here is the real question that I have for you that, you know, our takeaway, you know, many of the people that are listening to this podcast, they are already doing myopia management, but how um, how can we utilize this paper? And I've got some ideas. I'm sure you do as well to to help equip um, other practitioners in becoming seeing this as standard of care. And how do we equip practitioners utilizing this information to help parents understand that this is becoming standard of care? Because there's still a big question around this. Of I've never heard of this before, mm -hmm. right? I think uh, seeing it in print with um recognizable citations from very reputable sources mm -hmm. is a way toward recognition 
amongst our own colleagues in eye care, amongst yeah. medical professionals that are pediatricians and uh, primary care givers. Uh, many of those kind of people need something in print. They can't just take the word of the doctor up the street. They want to see something that's validated, that's yeah. scientifically backed. And I think that is a, an important factor. And, and I think this letter that I wrote has that kind of a backing and those kind of uh, reputable sources to go on. But I think there are other ones that are out there. Another very uh, recently published paper by our friend Mark Bullimore mm -hmm. is, um, is called Myopia Management, Seeing Beyond Efficacy. Yeah. And I'm sure you've seen that, but yeah. basically it talks not just about how much you're slowing myopia, but the other very important factors when you enter into myopia management with a child that include, you know, the compliance of whatever you're prescribing, compliance with this, uh, their overall quality of vision, uh, the, the big factor that I always like, quality of life, vision-related yeah. quality of life is improved when people are, patients are using uh, ortho K specifically and soft lenses mm -hmm. as well versus glasses and, and safety issues that are involved. But the quality of life issues that you, the patients benefit from are, are immediate, meaning, you know, with ortho K, the quality of life, they don't have to wear correction during the day. Short term, um, they can do other activities that they may not have ventured into and, and long-term things that are hopefully reducing their overall risk for uh, serious disease as an adult. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's so key. And so I just want to point out to everybody where I think this really can come into play is, is there are enough practitioners that are out there as well as um, patients and parents who want to know that this is this is the way that it should be going. Um, we're doing this in our office because we consider the standard of care, and so many other people mm -hmm. consider the standard of care. So you may not have heard of this yet, but that's because we're on top of our game. We're up up to speed with what people should be doing in their practice, utilizing the resources that Dr. Lipson put into this paper, which will include the link in this podcast. But if you simply type in letter to the editor, myopia management is now standard of care, you will be directed to the OVS, Optometry Vision Science um, uh, article there. And then he also mentioned the one about myopia control seeing beyond efficacy, which if you simply type that in, you will get a, uh, a, a, a directed to that on, on Google or, or Bing or whatever you use but also we'll include both of those links. Having those resources available for parents who are questioning or curious about it or including it in your myopia management implementation packet um, can really be helpful. And then those are the, also the resources that you can send out to referring physicians and clinicians, um, pediatricians that you work with, uh, naturopathic doctors that you work with. But having those resources from print can be so valuable. So thank you, Dr. Lipson, for putting all this together. I know no that's uh, a, a lot of work and uh, yeah, no problem. But it was a lot of work. You you did a lot in coming <laughs> up with the uh, resources page is really huge on, on all of your, well, good. your citations. I, I think you bring up a great point too, because I think talking to the parents is also a pretty critical part of this. And some of them now are very educated yeah. and certainly very experienced with myopia, yeah. <laughs> meaning from their some own personal are. experience. Yeah. And so basically, as you kind of described it just now, I mean, when you're making your case presentation to the patient and the parents, you can say, well, when you were growing up, you know, basically all we had was you know, prescribing glasses or contacts. And now things have developed. There's a, there's a new game in town, <laughs> basically, is we are now able to intervene to change that course of myopia progression for your child. Yeah, absolutely. So key, so key. Well, awesome. Um, we uh, we sure appreciate you bringing this up to us. And uh, any closing thoughts here on what to do next and where do we go uh, or what you're working on that you're going to enlighten us with in the future? 
Oh, I, I'm still relating to Ortho K a lot, yes. which is my, my first love. And I think I still feel like that is the best intervention for myopia progression. Um, there's so many advantages to it and uh, it, the kids enjoy it and it really has an impact and it, it really affected my practice. And it's the biggest growth opportunity, I think, for any individual practitioner in terms of word of mouth referrals. Um, people yeah. love it. And, and they just the word spreads very quickly through the community that this is something special going on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for being on the show. We sure appreciate your perspective. That was great. That's 43 my pleasure. references. You had yes. a huge, huge uh, effort there. And we're sure grateful for the work that you do. And thank you for joining us for the Myopia podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe. Stay tuned for next time. And make sure to check out the Myopia workshop for how to implement myopia management in your practice and increase your conversions with your patients. We'll see you next time. One, two. Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.